بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله So this is um, the second lesson going into uh, Muslim theology um, The last time we talked about a little bit of just an introduction and setting up a cognitive frame and uh, we're just going to continue in doing that. Um, like I said before, the actual mutun themselves, once you have the right cognitive frame, the actual text when you study uh, what Muslim belief is, is not that difficult if you just uh, pay close attention to it. It's not that hard to understand. Um, it becomes hard to understand only when you don't have the right cognitive frame, when you don't have the right basis to start off from. However, from uh, just with any knowledge uh, that you begin with in Islam, with any field of knowledge that you begin with, there's something called, um, the scholars uh, have this nice little couplet, um, there are like three lines of poetry, um, that basically define what all of this is about. And... Um, before we get into that, I'm just going to tell you something here. It's uh, The lines of poetry are In um, mabadi'a kulli fannin ashara Al-haddu wal mawdu'u thumma al-thamara Wa nisbatun wa fadluhu wal wadi'u Wa lismu listimdadu hukmu al-shari'u Masailun wal ba'du bil ba'du iktafa Wa man dara al-jami'a haza al-sharafa These are basically the ten beginnings that uh, the scholars have spoken about. And they say that for every line, every type of knowledge, in for every type of knowledge, there's ten beginnings. In the, the definition of it, what is it that we're talking about? And is the content. And what's the benefit of studying this thing? And what is, it, it, uh, what is its relation to the other uh, sacred sciences, وفضله, and what is its um, um, uh, al-fadl is like uh, Allah Muhammad Sayyidina Muhammad to translate that. It's um, what is it? Uh, we'll get. I'll, I'll have to explain it in a minute when I get it. Well, wadi'u al is um, who put it to, who put it together, who codified it. والاسم الاستمداد حكم الشارع. الاسم is the names that it's been called. Al-istimdad is where does it get its uh, sciences from, its knowledge is from, this field of knowledge, the content, where does it get the content from. Hukm al sharia is what is the legal ruling according to sharia of this particular field of knowledge. Masailun wal ba'du bil ba'du iktafa. Masail is the specific matters that it deals with. Wal ba'du bil ba'du iktafa. And some have just sufficed themselves with just a little bit of it. Um, and the one that knows and encompasses that particular field of knowledge completely, that one becomes honored. Now before you get into any field of knowledge, no matter what it is, <coughs> there is uh, what they call jahalatan uh, wa'abathan. There is two uh, types of ignorances, jahalatani. The two ignorances are mahda aw urfiya. Mahda is basically complete ignorance of that knowledge. And mahda is it's when you don't know anything about that knowledge or anything that it's about. Hiya adam al mahda al jahala tul mahda. Hiya adam ul ma'arifa al ma'arifa bil ilmi aslan aw shay in anhu. Aw hat tismahu. Even the name of it, if you hear, I mean, some people that if they haven't heard something called ilm al kalam. If they haven't heard of it even, even though it exists, that person is under a jahala mahda, a complete ignorance of that knowledge. And that particular ignorance is lifted when that individual that has never heard of it hears about it. Once he hears about it, that field of knowledge now enters into, its, uh, into that person's uh, conceptualization, even if the conceptualization is not completely clear. But now they know about there's something called ilm al-kalam. Al-Jahal al urfiya which is the customary ignorance of it, is basically when you have a lot of, if you look at the general population, most of us have a lot of Jahal al urfiya about a lot of knowledges. That basically means we've heard about them, but we don't know, we haven't conceptualized its uh, formation, 
its uh, uh, status. And the only way we can get rid of this particular ignorance is basically to know the actual definition of that science and the content of it and what is its purpose what is it trying to solve you don't have to get into a complete um, intimate knowledge of that science but to know something about it to know how it's uh, how it's formed and what the content deals with and the specific questions that they're trying to answer that's when you lift off the customary ignorance of that particular field of knowledge Al-abathan, abath is when you um, get into something and you don't know what you're doing. That's what we call abath in Arabic. And again, for abath, for the, there's two types of abath, mahda and urfiya as well. Al-abath al-mahd, this type of just uh, delving into things without any type of knowledge, is to get into this particular field of knowledge without knowing its benefit of it, with the fruit that you can derive from it, and you can lift off that type of, um, that uh, essential type of abath off by just knowing what the fruit of this knowledge is. What are you supposed to get from it at the end of it? What would you know? Al-Urfi, the customary type of abath, is basically what most Muslims do nowadays when it comes to sacred knowledge, which is going in and delving into it without knowing the... Uh, benefit that you would derive based on having gone into it deeply and uh, and uh, spent a lot of effort and sweat and tears reading the books and doing the work on it and and figuring out who said what and really like spending the time most people don't like spending the time so for example the current age of uh, Sheikh Google and Imam YouTube and uh, Ustad Facebook all of that is really Abath Urfi all of it. People don't know what it takes to get that type of knowledge, um, the specific intricate details that deal with it, and so that's all abath urfi. There's a, a rule, a foundational principle, that says, "Ma'rifatul ilmi bihaddihi tatfa'ul jahalatani." Knowing the the field of knowledge by definition, not just knowing by name, but knowing by definition, lifts off automatically the two types of ignorances. وَمَعْرِفَةُ الْفَائِدَةُ الْمُوَازِيَةُ لِعَنَائِهِ تَدْفَعُ الْعَبَثَيْنِ And having experienced the fruit of that field of knowledge from spending a lot of time and effort in getting that type of knowledge, that lifts off the two types of abaths. Okay? And that's, that's, that's basically uh, when you go into the Al-Mabadi' Al-Ashra, that tries to lift off these ignorances. So like we said, إن مبادئ كل فن عشرة الحد والموضوع ثم الثمرة ونسبة وفضله والواضع والاسم الاستمداد حكم الشارع مسائل والبعض بالبعض اكتفاء ومن درى الجميع حاز الشرف. If you get into the science of tafsir, it has the مبادئ العشرة of of علم التفسير. If you go into علم الحديث, the مبادئ العشرة لعلم الحديث, the مبادئ العشرة لعلم الأصول, لعلم الفقه, and it goes on and on لعلم اللغة العربية. علم الشعر you have المبادئ العشرة for all of it so for علم التوحيد because you need to know what المبادئ العشرة for it before you delve into the different texts and mutun and what not الحد إن مبادئ كل فن عشرة so we'll talk about علم التوحيد الحد the first thing the first مبدأ the first beginning الحد which is the definition of what علم التوحيد is and the You'll find different definitions that all revolve around. It is the science that with it you can codify and assert the creed of religion. Based and specifically Islam. And that's by going into the proofs and um, the principles of it. And also lifting off all types of red herrings people might put on your way to try to uh, deviate people away from it. That's the science of Tawheed. al mawdu' which is the content of it, is basically all the things that deal with how do you prove the foundational principles of this Tawheed. Um, the content of every knowledge is, or every, every field of knowledge is what is searched about within that field of knowledge, all the things that, re that are researched. And when it comes to Ilm al-Tawheed, 
we're talking about what is uh, necessary for uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such as uh, his qidam uh, pre-eternal nature al uh, wahda that he is uniquely one wal qudra his his ability wal irada his will and other ones and all the things that are impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such as that he was created that's impossible for him at ta'addud you know uh, having many of uh, many gods al uh, jismiya having a, a bodily feature anthropomorphism that's not in the muslim creed you'll find it in other creeds and um, that's basically the content of ilm tawhid wa thumma thamara al hadd wa al mawdu'u thumma thamara the thamara is the fruit the fruit of knowing uh, of ilm tawhid is knowing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you know what is necessary and what is impossible for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all that is necessary and impossible for the prophets what will end up for you is your belief your faith your acknowledgement of uh, the sharia itself becomes certain and if you hear somebody giving you a particular um, shubha something that can try to shake your faith it won't shake your faith if you know if you have these things really embedded within your being and the only way you can do that is through knowledge that's it's uh, it's a benefit there the benefit when it comes to the to this world of you know the fruit of this uh, knowledge field in this world is that once you have certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you accept that and you accept the incumbent uh, regulations upon you what will end up happening is you will have order in justice and in uh, treatment between uh, people in a way that will sustain the existence of uh, humanity in a way that will not allow them to go into uh, deviance later on or even uh, basically ending their own um, existence such as for example we have uh, one of the issues that um, people are trying to deal with in, in the West which is really from a Muslim perspective is an ethical issue is um, global warming and um, what rights do the forest have I mean, uh, the West talks about uh, human rights and animal rights. Well, Islam talks about the rights of trees and the rights of mountains and the rights of uh, flowers. And the right, I mean, if you actually study the Islamic uh, ethics behind all these things, we can show them, like we, this is our field when it comes to rights. We have the rights of the universe rather than just the rights of a couple of things. The only way you can assert these things is if you have certainty that is only arrived at through knowledge of the field of knowledge of tawhid that's the benefit in this world in the next world it has a different benefit which is the clear one uh, being saved from the hellfire and uh, being able to get into um, uh, into uh, paradise insha'Allah وَنِسْبَةٌ what is the relationship of this field of knowledge tawhid to all the other fields of knowledge such as Tafsir and uh, hadith and fiqh and usul and all these things. It's the foundation of all of these knowledges. If you don't have tawheed, you ain't got nothing. Um, one of the major scholars have said uh, that the relation of this knowledge to all the others is that this particular knowledge, tawheed, is kulli, it's general, encompassing. And the rest of uh, fields of sacred knowledge are juz'iyat. They're just uh, specific portions of the, uh, of, uh, the sacred uh, knowledge field. For example, when you look at somebody who's doing tafsir, the only thing he looks at is he looks the, where he derives his knowledge from to, to look at and explain is literally just the Qur'an. That's the only thing he goes with to explain. Obviously, he uses hadith and things like that, but in reality, the one thing that he's working with is the Qur'an. Al-Muhaddith, what is his field of knowledge? His field of knowledge is explaining, just bringing in about the hadith, not even explaining it, really. He just brings about the hadith and confirms the asanid and confirms the chains of transmission and whatnot. Al-Usuli simply looks at, at, at dalil al-shari. He looks at the, uh, the, 
the Sharia based evidence, the proof only. That's what he's looking at. Well, Faqih, the one who does fiqh, he just looks at the actions of Al Mukallaf, the one that is legally responsible. That's what Al Faqih does. Is it permissible to do this or is it not permissible to do it? Um, is it Sunnah to do this? Is it Fadila to do that? That's what the Faqih does. Al Mutakallim which is the person who looks at ilm al-tawheed though, he's the one that looks at the general of everything, al-a'am, which is all that exists. That's what someone who deals with ilm al-tawheed does. He looks at everything, the all of existence. Whether it's, um, uh, and he looks at, div at dividing it into what is pre-eternal, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what is caused into coming into existence. And he also divides the, uh, the uh, thing that is existing into different categories. And he divi divides the different categories into different things as well, subcategories. So that's what, he looks at everything that exists. And to do that, the one that does ilm al-tawheed literally has to look at everything. He has to look at tafsir, he has to, like, he has to look at hadith, he has to look at adillah, he has to look at all of these things in order for him to assert what is ilm al-tawheed. Fadluhu, Basically looking at this, the rank of this knowledge in opposed to other knowledges. And the rank of Ilm al-Tawheed huwa ashraf al-uloom al-shari'iyya wa afdaluha. It is the most noble of all of the sacred knowledges and it is the highest in rank. Because knowing it, knowing Ilm al-Tawheed and having that type of knowledge is the most noble, ty noble type of knowledge and it's the highest in rank. And obviously that co the content of which will go with that so and the reason for that is really the the whole purpose of ilm al-tawheed is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how all of that fits together and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the definitely the most noble of all knowledges more noble than knowledge of fiqh more noble than knowledge of uh of tafsir, more noble of everything. And the reason it's more noble is because all the other knowledges with their nobility, they're parts of this greater nobility. Because they just look at parts. It's the mutakallim, the one that does tawheed, he's getting everything together and combining it all together to give you this particular type of knowledge, which is knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the proofs that are used in ilm al-tawheed is what is uh, in... Uh, 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 Sharia terminology called qat'iyya. It's unequivocal. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about unequivocal proofs. Whereas the proofs that are used in the other fields of knowledge, they're all dhaniya. They're equivocal. They can, for the most part, that is. Um, they can accept, in a lot of places, various interpretations. Obviously, this does not mean, um, this does not include things to do with uh, having to pray five times a day and all this is this that's fiqh but that's qat'i as well that's things that you have to do we're talking about the greater um, I just list, I just heard a thing by uh, Imam Suhaib Webb and I've actually heard it from various azharis as well um, that the sharia the qat'i part of it is three percent ninety seven percent of it is dhanni meaning equivocal whereas three percent is unequivocal tawheed falls within the three percent it's one of those things that you just, there's no, uh, there's no discussion on the matter. Now, when you're talking about uh, uh, unequivocal proofs that are used here, what ends up happening from them is um, eternal happiness and bliss, which does not happen except through ilm al-tawheed. Give you an example to clarify that. If a non-Muslim comes right now and prays Aisha with you, that prayer doesn't do them any good. Even if all of the fiqh of it is right, if they come in believing that they're praying to Jesus Christ, وسلم, or they're praying to Moses, or praying to Buddha, or praying to any, any other being, even if the fiqh is completely right, and they're reciting Quran properly, and doing all these things, if their tawheed is not there, that's not going to get them eternal bliss. And that's the point of this knowledge. The other thing is, um, all of the other knowledges are not sought after for themselves. Meaning, um, when you seek knowledge of fiqh, your purpose of seeking knowledge of fiqh is to do action with knowledge of fiqh. 
That's the purpose of knowledge of fiqh. Whereas knowledge of tawheed is sought for itself. You don't make an action based on knowledge of tawheed. Knowledge of tawheed is sought for itself. And a knowledge that is sought for itself is definitely more noble than knowledge that is sought for something else. You get what I'm saying? So when you're looking at, um, and the way they say that in Arabic is, um, سائر العلوم وسائر العلوم لا تراد لنفسها وإنما تراد للعمل بها والعلوم العقلية تراد لنفسها Because that's knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're seeking that for itself. You're not seeking it for anything else. The other thing about other knowledge fields that just shows you all of this is just proof that knowledge of Tawheed is the highest type of knowledge you can get. The other uh, knowledges, uh, aside from not being sought for themselves, they actually end after you perish. So your knowledge of fiqh, when you go to your grave, you're done. Your knowledge of uh, tafsir, when you go to your grave, it's done. Your knowledge of whatever else, when you go, you know, my knowledge of neuroscience, once I perish in my grave, it's done. The only knowledge that will stay with you for knowledge-wise, I'm not talking about actions here, we're talking about knowledge, the only knowledge that will stay with you in your grave is ilm al-tawheed. And in fact, it becomes even clear when you're in the grave. And it becomes necessary. Now, because it's the foundation, ilm al-tawheed is the foundation for all of the other sacred knowledges, and all of this that I have mentioned before, uh, points to its nobility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says in Surah Al Imran, Shahid Allah Annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaikatu wa ulul ilm. Ulul ilm here in tafsir is referred to ulama at tawheed. It's looking at people of uh, of tawheed here. Al wadi' now that we've established the fadl of this knowledge, the rank of it. Al-Wadi', the one who put it down and codified it, it depends on how you look at it um, uh, from different perspectives. Um, if you want to look at who put this knowledge down, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's so many verses in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, co- has clarified the aqidah, the creed of the Muslims, and all the proofs of it. However, who codified it? Who wrote it down afterwards? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed it to us, but who wrote it down? The one that wrote it down, according to uh, most uh, scholars that have looked at the history of this, it started off with Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and Imam Malik. Imam Malik is said to be the first one to write a, an official uh, risala on it, an official kind of treatise on this particular field of knowledge. But when you're looking at ilm al-kalam, which is what it really became afterwards, didactic theology, the first one, according to many of the scholars, to codify it properly for Ahl sunnah because from last time we said that the Muslims really um, got into uh, uh, trying to codify it to deal with all the different theologies that were present at the time. The first one to uh, put for Ahl sunnah a codified aqidah is Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. And he's the one to really kind of uh, go through and um, answer all the different contentions of the Mu'tazila and, and uh, respond to all the different uh, uh, red herrings that are being put up by all the different theological groups. So as far as we're concerned for Ahl sunnah and, and I've mentioned this before um, in the last lesson and i mentioned it on other occasions, if you travel across the Muslim Ummah, you really come across two Imams that are considered to be Imams of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, which is Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi and Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari. Both of them are considered to be the Imams of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, by and large. Um, they're the ones that basically responded to all the different um, uh, innovations that are being brought about and all the different philosophies and, and things that deal with theology. Um, in a way that wasn't done before them. Moreover, the imams that came after them, like Imam uh, Fakhreddin al-Razi and Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali and others, 
what they've done is they just expanded, but they use the same usul of uh, theology that have been codified by Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari and Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. However, if you look at some, what uh, some of the other scholars have uh, said about this particular content of knowledge itself, al wadi and who put it, um, it's a knowledge that is Qur'aniya. It's a knowledge that is from the Qur'an. Because it's all, co- it's all put together in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Qur'an the creeds of several groups, Jews, Christians, even materialists are mentioned in the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a lot of different creeds in the Qur'an. He mentioned the nubuwat. He mentioned the prophecies. He mentioned uh, and the prophets. He mentioned um, uh, the revelations. And all of that basically points to, and everything, and, and he even points, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points to the hudut al-alam. The causality of this world, the existence of this world out of nothing. And showing how that is proof for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ Surah Al-Anbiya As we have created the first uh, creation, we will bring it back. قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ Surah Yaseen Say, the one who um, created it first will create it again, will bring it back to life again. And he's most knowledgeable by of every creation that he has. Uh, the one who has made to, for you from uh, green trees, fire. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran the proofs of, of Ibrahim alayhi salam and all the other prophets that basically when they go and they start debating with all the, all the Fir'aun and uh, uh, when they did, uh, when uh, when Musa debated Fir'aun and when uh, Ali Salam uh, Musa uh, debated Fir'aun and you have Ibrahim Ali Salam debating Nimrod, all of the all of these different things are mentioned in the Quran. And so, if you look at the actual knowledge itself, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has codified it for us in the Quran in a uh, in a beautiful way. And it it doesn't need it didn't need for uh, human beings to interfere to tell us that this is how you should be believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and, and that's really what ilm al-kalam is. It's all based on Qur'an. Um, it's not based on just people making up things. Um, one of the, and I'll tell you uh, an example of that. For example, for us we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he's ar-Rahman, he's the most merciful. Um, William Craig Lane I think his name was William Lane Craig, this uh, Christian apologist uh, philosopher. He had a debate with, uh, uh, he, had, he had a lecture and I saw a Muslim student get up and he asked him a question about, you know, what, what do you say about the understanding of God and Islam? And he said it's not great enough. Well, when you ask him, why do you say that it's not great enough? And he says, he's not all loving. Well, that particular uh, assertion it is not a logical necessity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be all loving. Now you're asserting your own type of criteria to tell us what God to believe in. So he's actually setting himself up to go with the Christian understanding. Whereas if you just divorced yourself away from that and just go like, well, being all loving is not something that is necessary to the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God. If God tells us that he's all loving, then that's great. But if he doesn't, that's also fine. It, it doesn't take away anything away from God. So when you're looking at ilm al-kalam, we don't have something like that, where we assert something that is not a logical necessity to, uh, to God. Now, Imam uh, Tajuddin al-Subki, he mentions in Tabaqat al-Shafi'i al-Kubra, he says that, know that Ibn al Hassan, he did not come with a new thing. He didn't innovate anything new. And he, doesn't, he didn't start a new madhab in uh, theology. All he was doing is, he was uh, uh, codifying what the Salaf already believed. He was just putting it in uh, theological terms, what the Salaf were already believing. And he just wanted to assert what the Sunnah was asserting and what the Quran was asserting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about the creed of the Muslims. So when you attribute um, your uh, theological uh, training to the Ash'ari way, all you're doing is you're just asserting that this is the, what the Salaf, in theological terms, what they believed. 
just because they didn't assert it in theological terms doesn't mean that it's not true. Al-ism, as we go through this uh, didactic uh, couplet, وَالِسْمُ الْإِسْتِمْدَادُ حُكْمُ الشَّارِعُ Al-ism, the name of the science, what is it called? I've been calling it Ilm al-Tawheed this whole time. That's one name for it, and it's called Ilm al-Kalam as well. Um, and it's called uh, Ilm al-Tawheed wa sifat And it's been known as Ilm al-Kalam because at the, in the past, what they used to say was Al-Kalamu fi kada wa kada. That's how they used to say it, the scholars back then. They say that the speech in such and such is, is such. And because kalam, how you talk, became the central thing that was researched and how they talked about it, it became known as ilmul kalam. How do you say, how do you believe, how do you articulate what you believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's why it was called ilmul kalam. Also, it's been called ilmul usul al-deen, uh, the science of usul al-deen, the foundations of this deen. Why? Because this is what religion is built, built upon. Also, it's been called Ilm al-Aqaid, the science of creed, um, or different creeds. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he gave it a beautiful name. He called it Al-Fiqh al-Akbar. It is the greater fiqh to know what you believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Istimdad, where does it get us knowledge from? Where, where does it get us content from? This ilm of tawheed, of kalam, of aqaid, usul al-deen, whatever you want to call it. Where does it derive its um, knowledge from? Istimdad of it comes from uh, Quran and Sunnah and consensus. That's one part, as well as al adilla al aqliya the rational proofs, the pure reason, rational proofs. That's where it gets it. So from, um, so you can get it from tafsir, you can get it from hadith. Uh, you can get it from Hukm uh, al like we said, uh, the intellectual ruling. And in reality, if you look at the Quran itself, it's enough for you to get all of what you need for Ilm uh, al-Tawheed. The Quran is, is sufficient. You don't have to go any further than the Quran. Um, as you, what you find as you build upon um, uh, branches of this particular knowledge and going into different little semantical type of issues, what you end up with is having to go a little bit into a hadith mutawatira and you go into a little bit of, and you start delving into different matters. But that's, if you want to know just the foundational things and the things that you have to know, the Quran is sufficient. Hukm al-Shari' and that's where it takes us to Hukm al-Shari' how far do you have to go? Hukm al-Shari' is the legal ruling of this field of knowledge. Imam al-Laqani says in Jawharat al-Tawheed وَبَعْدُ فَالْعِلْمُ بِأَصْلِ الدِّينِ مُحَتَّمٌ يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى التَّبْيِينِ He says, and like so, the knowledge of the foundation of this deen, which is Tawheed, مُحَتَّمٌ It is necessary. يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى التَّبْيِينِ And it requires clarification at some part, at some, in some parts. Now, it's necessary for who? When you're looking at um, the general proofs, which I mentioned before is basically like Surah Al-Ikhlas, and just some general proofs for uh, the existence of God and whatnot, those general proofs are required to be known by everybody. Every Muslim needs to learn these things. So this metan right now that we're going into, the Creed of Deliverance by Imam uh, Muhammad ibn Ja'far uh, al-Kattani, al-Fasi, um, that is, it's only 17 lines, this is really the bare minimum that a Muslim needs to know. Once you go into a delve into more uh, complicated things and you want to go into bigger mutun and whatnot, that is called uh, and getting into dalila tafsili, like uh, exact proofs and um, detailed proofs of certain things in the Sharia. That is kafai. That's fort kafaya, meaning some people in the community need to dedicate their time to study the specific detailed proofs of these things. We're living in a time right now, in order for you to understand the specific proofs, you really have to do some science. You need to understand how theories, uh, specifically actually, more important than biology, you have to know some quantum physics. 
and I don't mean get a degree in quantum physics, but you need to be versed in it. You need to understand these things and how um, theoretical physics has advanced and what new realms it has arrived at. Because believe it or not, there's still a lot of people that think that the smallest thing is a proton, an electron, and a neutron. They haven't been keeping up with all of the different things that they've been finding um, that go basically into negating all solids and just going into energies with string theory. You have to know a little bit of quantum physics and know how quantum mechanics works and have, and that's what I mean by when we talked about earlier at the beginning, al jahalatan wal abathan. You need to lift al jahalatan and al abathan for yourself when you're, uh, if you want to know a little bit more uh, in depth theology. Well, uh, you need to lift the jahalatan al abathan on quantum physics, quantum mechanics. You also need to lift it off for uh, things like uh, in biology, like evolutionary biology. Um, you'll need to know these things in order for you to be able to address some of the modern contentions that people can bring up, and atheists specifically, that will uh, put forth in order to shake the belief of, uh, and the faith of uh, Muslims. That's, that becomes Fort Kifaya. So people that are like imams in masajid, uh, muftis in towns, they need to know these things. It's, it's become Fort Ain on these people to know these things and know it well so that they can answer all these questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْلَمُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That is a command by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's from Surah Muhammad. So, again, like we said, Dalil Ijmali, general proofs, like the 17 lines that we're going to go through here for Imam Ja'far, Muhammad ibn Ja'far Katani in Aqidat al-Najat, that one is for the general public. Everybody needs to know this stuff. But when you're going into specific details, that's when you need to get yourself uh, attached with uh, lifting off al-Jahalatan and al-Abathan, the two ignorances and the two uh, uh, specific ignorances really of uh, things like quantum mechanics and evolutionary biology and whatnot. Masail. الحكم الحكم اللي اسمه الاستمداد وحكم الشارع ومسائل المسائل is really the the specific cases and and contents and things that are dealt with in this knowledge that's what مسائل are some of them have to deal with proofs that are arrived at using logic and whatnot others have proofs that are given to you through the شريعة um, and that's what masail are. Uh, and some people have just sufficed themselves with a little bit of this stuff. And whoever has encompassed all of these things, all of the ten things with their specific details, that person will nail um, a, a, noble st- a noble rank and a noble status. That's al mabadi al ashra for ilm al tawheed. One thing that I wanted to clarify is what, what, when it comes to the intellect. We say that Al-Islam deen al-aql. Islam is the religion for the intellect. What are we talking about when it deals with theology, for example? You arrive to the existence of God. You arrive to knowledge of God, that He exists through your pure reason, through rational in- intelligence. Once you arrive at that, and you arrive at that the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad ﷺ, is the final messenger, once you get to these things, when you get the revelation itself, you suspend your judgment over the revelation. You no longer become the judge of it. You use your intellect, you subject it to it. In much the same way, which is really what uh, atheists um, are being hypocritical about in a sense, um, when they talk about empiricism and rationalism. Empiricism is just basically really materialism. That we only have knowledge of things that deal with the sensoria, five senses. They subject their reason to that. They subject their reason to empiricism. Pure reason needs to be able to fly. It can't be restricted to just empiricism. We subject as Muslims our reason to the revelation after we arrive to the logical necessity of God, of the Messenger wasallam. The fact that he came with this revelation, and then we say, okay, now let's get into understanding this revelation using our intellect. The difference between the Ash'aris and the Mu'tazila was that the Mu'tazila, 
use their intellect to judge the revelation. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something in the Quran that to them, to the Mu'tazila, is problematic intellectually, and we're not talking about science here, we're talking about theology. To them is problematic theologically, they will assert their intellect and negate what the Quran is saying. That's what the Mu'tazila have. So when Allah tells you, وَجُوهُنْ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ The Mu'tazila will say that's impossible. That's the problem with the Mu'tazila. Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari was a Mu'tazila initially. And that's where the Salafis have a problem with him. They confuse him for uh, his period during, uh, during, uh, during his period as a Mu'tazili. And they think that Ash'aris right now, and some of them are fair. They'll say, no, he left his I'tizal. But the Ash'aris of nowadays, nowadays are going with his previous Aqidah, which is not true. That's not fair to Ash'aris nowadays. And it's not fair to Imam al-Ash'ari himself. So we're using our intellect to arrive at the ra- uh, rational necessity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once we do that, then we suspend our judgment over it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge and we use our intellect to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. So that's the general mabadi al-ashra that everybody needs to know before delving into any particular science. Um, and I think... That should suffice for now. The, the last thing I wanted to say is, as you delve into these things, and um, basically what you'll have to do is, um, uh, it, it's, it's a bit difficult because we have a, a progression of knowledges that we go through. Um, and I think uh, the study of the progression of knowledges is more suited for uh, lessons on logic rather than this particular thing. So I want to just keep it specific to Tawheed right now. But... What you'll have to do is um, get into your rational realm and um, try to understand that there are some things that you will be able to uh, rationalize and, without, and, and conceptualize be, without being able to actually uh, visualize. And the ability to visualize relies upon having knowledge that was arrived at through the five senses. You'll be able to rationalize some things, but you may have difficulty conceptualizing it because you haven't felt it, such as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that you can rationally accept. It makes, you know, with your intellect, you can arrive at it. But once you try to visualize it, conceptualize it as a concept, as an anthropomorphic thing, that's when you start having problems. And that's where atheists fall into uh, problematic conclusions. Like when Richard Dawkins says, uh, who created God? He's trying to use his senses as something that will judge over what is real and what is not. And I think we'll leave it at that, inshallah. Um, we'll uh, definitely, I think we've covered enough of a cognitive frame, uh, setting up a cognitive frame for what we're talking about, and then uh, getting you the Mabadi al Ashra for Ilm al Tawheed. And then, inshallah, in the third lesson, we'll go into. The uh, bio- a brief biography of uh, the Imam that wrote this uh, metan, as well as uh, get into the actual lines of it. And uh, once we get into the lines of it, this is not something that will take very long. Like I said, it's 17 lines. I suspect that it might take uh, maybe, I don't know, three, four lessons tops to go through it. Like I said, it's a simple creed, and inshallah, it will, um, it will be just uh, very straightforward and make sense. And then as you embody it and, and live it, we can go on into something more complicated and it will just build upon it from that point on. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.